The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God. If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher, and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and biblical truth. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together under the principle of freedom. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to the things that we note and give us the concentration necessary to assemble these difficult things of the Word of God into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8, verse 21. Now I know we studied that for a bit last night, but there's something that I left out concerning this because uh, remember when they first wrote the Bible, there were no verses, there were no chapters. It was written like a book. And uh, so they didn't, they didn't have 821, and they didn't have 822 and 823. And even though there's about to be a switch in subjects, it's still uh, pertaining to the same thing. Now, I got some statistics today. I haven't looked at the statistics on the website for a long time. So I decided to look today and see how, how it's been going, if it's been growing or shrinking or what. Uh, but what I got from it, and I can't remember if if it was more before or more now or whatever, but in one week there were 96 hits. doesn't mean that 96 people listened. It means they were they checked it out anyway. In one week, I guess that's the highest week that they gave me, 96 hits. The highest one day total is 54, and over the whole month, 456. Now, of course, some of those could be repeats just coming to listen to the message. And all the messages have been hit and are being listened to by others outside of this congregation. And they do give me feedback on occasion. And some of it's not nice. Some of it is. Some of it's encouraging. Some of it's not. And so sometimes when I get fired up, it's, it's, it might not be at you. It might be at someone else who has been criticizing me. And so please don't take anything I say personal. It is never, ever personal. And I don't talk about you behind your backs. That would be inappropriate for any pastor. I just don't do it. I don't even think of anyone badly. Now, I do get fired up and chew out from the pulpit, but it's impersonal, and I hope all of you can take it as impersonal. And just understand that uh, I don't dislike any of you. I love all of you very, very much. And I want to see all of you grow in grace and in knowledge. But Matthew is going to be very difficult because I know that uh, you've been raised differently, or some of you have. And I can understand the resistance, definitely, because, well, you've never heard it this way, and you've never heard uh, Jesus Christ being so bold, but he, he is. And we are going to study, and it's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. If you're, if you're looking for something sweet, I'm sorry. It's not going to be in these next few verses which we study because Jesus Christ, mainly in the Greek and Aramaic, it comes out a little bit in the English, but some of those words that are used like son in one passage doesn't convey what Christ was saying. He insults Christ, insults a paralytic, a crippled man. And he does it for a reason. You see, Christ wasn't a respecter of men. He didn't care what people thought about him. That's why he went to the cross. He could have cared less. He had a mission to follow. Now, I'm not Jesus Christ, but I do have a mission to follow. And that mission is to give you the Bible straight. And sometimes you might be offended. Heck, when I look at some passages, I get offended because I realize, hey, man, you've been wrong in some areas. You need to change your lifestyle in some areas. We all do. We all have sin natures. It's just something that we must do. And it's never a personal thing. 
and, and sometimes it's tough love, but it's always in, there's always behind it all. I'm not doing it because of hatred. I'm not doing it because of any type of animosity or power struggle. I'm not into that stuff. I love doing what I'm doing just so that you can be edified in your soul and so that you can pick up on it and have happiness. Because Bible doctrine is the only key to happiness. Nothing else is going to give it to you. Now, there are details of life that strangle us. They've strangled me before. Shoot, I thought I could win a bunch of money gambling one time, got all ecstatic. Wouldn't even think about hearing a tape. I was up there, man, I'm going to gamble all day long, all night. And, whew, I was winning too. And my wallet got about, I couldn't even fit the money in it anymore. It was about that thick. And during that whole time, listening to Bible doctrine was the last thing on my mind. It's like, man, that is some cash right there. If I keep going, I'll be wealthy. Well, I kept going and lost every dime. Well, that's the way it goes in Vegas. You're an idiot if you think you can win money. And, but you can occasionally by luck, but uh, gambling will not make you rich, except that in a few cases there have been some professional gamblers, but they obviously have a little more sense than I do. But you see, what I'm saying is we all have weeds that come up and strangle us at times. And we all have uh, moments when we are in conflict with ourselves. Do I go to church or do I do something else that is also important, not as important as this, but also important. I understand all of us have those conflicts. I don't have those conflicts anymore because this is my job now. So I don't, I don't have a regular job where I have to get up, go to work, and sweat with my brow in the hot sun and then think I need to get it done otherwise I'm going to go under. And all of that's a legitimate thought of, of working hard and doing all that. And I understand that. And sometimes I might get a little hot-headed because I want you to see things. And I want you to get it. I want you to understand it like that. And I know it takes time. And I don't mean to force it down your throat and choke you off or whatever. No, I want you to be here. I don't hate any of you. I love all of you very, very much. But I, at the beginning of Matthew, I made it very clear it's going to be tough. Because Jesus Christ is very, very tough with everyone. I mean, his disciples, as we studied last night, were all around him. He would chew them out all the time. We're going to see in just a moment where Jesus Christ just chewed the heck out of the people who had been surrounding him the whole time. And he loved those people very much, of course. He loves us very much. But he still chewed them out when they needed it. And it's not that you need it. Maybe you don't need it, but maybe somebody listening on the Internet needs it. And you see, when I'm up here, I'm filled with God, the Holy Spirit. I rebound like everyone else. And sometimes I get fired up and go on a tangent. It's not directed at anyone. Except I might have somebody who has written me a nasty email on my mind. And, tell, and think, well, they need to hear this. And they might go back and listen and say, hey, that guy's right. I needed a butt chewing. But it's not necessarily for each, every, every single one of us has a different spiritual status. And I can't look into your soul and say you're a loser or a winner. I don't have a clue. And I don't mean to do that or to mean to Im imply that in any way. And I am up for good advice. And that might be some good advice. Uh, that I receive from now and then the saying you're, you're a bit too tough on the, on the new believers. I can understand that. But I'm still going to be tough. And eventually, if you accept it or reject it, it's your business. And I am, I'll be sad if you reject it, but I can't do anything about it. And I can't change my personality. I can be soft when I think I need to be soft like I am now. And I can be tough when I think I need to be tough. But please, don't ever take it personally. This is an impersonal situation. And it has to be that way. And the, the problem is we have a small congregation. And when I get fired up and just start chewing people out, they might take it personally. I can understand that because there's so few. And sometimes I might be looking at you. Well, I look at about everybody while I'm talking. It's just I might glance at you, look at you for a minute. Then look at Brad and look at my wife, look at Darlene, whoever's here, just to see if they're getting it, because you can learn a lot from the eyes. Now, I don't know everything from your eyeballs. 
Now, I, I, I don't know if you're getting it or not sometimes. I mean, sometimes it's obvious, but I might be wrong. My pastor was wrong several times. I was very positive toward the Word of God, but uh, sometimes I would kind of glaze over while he was teaching, and he would rip me to shreds. And I didn't like it. It made me feel bad. It really did. The one time I felt bad for about a week. I didn't like it at all. And it was for something that did, I didn't even do. But he saw something and interpreted it wrong. Well, it's, it's, we're human. You see, we all have to have grace orientation because all of us are human. And we don't know, uh, and I don't know all the time what you're thinking. But sometimes I get caught up in the moment just preaching the Word of God, and here's Jesus talking about how important it is, so I want to relay it to you. Man, this is important, and I might do it with a pretty mean personality. It's not, I don't mean it to be uh, personal. I mean it to get you charged up, and, and some people have never been around that before, so they don't understand it. Now, others of you who have been around it your whole life, you like it. Because every time I get fired up, I always get a comment from my wife, Darlene, whoever. And they come up and they say, I love it when you get fired up like that. And then others don't like it. Well, it, it, it is a matter of personality. And we have to set that aside. Because there, I can't change my personality, whether it be good or bad. And, I, and really, I'm, a t I'm uh, outside of this pulpit, I'm a pretty dry person. I'm not much for conversation or anything else. Now, back when I was a drinking man, I could conversate pretty well. <laughs> but uh, those days are over. So what we have now is uh, 822 or 821. <clears throat> Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, permit me to first go and bury my father. Now, this is Jesus Christ being very, very tough. I mean, very tough. This man's just lost his father. No doubt he loves his father, which is natural. And no doubt he wants to go to his father's funeral. And so what, what's happening here is Jesus Christ is about to leave and go across the sea. He's about to go on to another place because he has a mission to fulfill. And that's probably mine again. You see, I need to chew my butt out. It's not, oh, well, who, who's ever it is. What was It might be the computer, which would be my fault too. And anyway, we have here another of the disciples said to him, Lord, permit me to first go and bury my father. His father's dead. There's people at the funeral. He wants to go there and present himself as protocol says. We all go to funerals. I go to funerals. Everybody goes to funerals. But here's Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And he's about to leave. And then what he is doing here is he's saying, look, that's a detail in your life. Because what he says in 822 is this. But Jesus said to him, now if we were reading this without voice inflection, you wouldn't get it. And voice inflection is necessary for the communication of the word of God. If I read it like this, but Jesus said to him, follow me and let the spiritually dead bury their own spiritually dead. You wouldn't get the meaning of it. it wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't understand the emphasis here. But what Jesus says to him is, follow me and let the spiritually dead, the unbelievers, bury their own dead. So he's telling him, look, it's not important. He's dead. You can't do anything about it. You have a life to live. You have a spiritual life to live. Follow me. That's a detail of life. It's not important. So I too get up and tell you, the details of life are not important. The Word of God is important. Follow me. Not follow me as a man, but follow the doctrine. Put it in your soul. Grow in grace. And if you are strangled by the weeds of uh, the details of life, you will, uh, you, you'll be just like this man. I got something else to do, Lord, but I'll follow you as soon as I get done with it. And this is the point of the passage. And when I have to teach it, I have to teach it. And, and when you're not here and you get offended when you come back and I make a point of it saying you need to be here because it's important, you get offended. 
Well, I'm sure this man was offended by our Lord, very offended. I mean, his father died. He wants to go to the funeral. And Jesus says, follow me. It would seem as if he had no compassion. So what we are dealing with here is a personality profile of our Lord Jesus Christ, one which we need to develop. And I've been thinking about this today, about the personality of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you grew up in a Baptist church or any of the other churches, your idea of Jesus Christ is a sweet man. He wasn't. He was hated. If he was sweet, they wouldn't have hung him on a cross. He was never. He was always in fellowship, of course, but he had a tough love. He, had, he knew how to deal with people with a tough love. And by the way, now that we are the children of Jesus Christ, now that we're in his family, he deals with us in, with a tough love. When we're out of fellowship, what does he do? Spank us, discipline us, get us back into line. And it hurts, and we don't like it. Who does? Only if you get a spiritually mature, you get to the point where you say, thank you, Father, I needed that discipline to wake me up. And we all have discipline, me included, everyone, to wake us up to what's important. And so uh, Jesus tells him, no, don't worry about going to your father's funeral. I know it's the protocol of life, but uh, follow me. This is more important than going to a funeral, is what he's saying. Now, I, now don't go away from here saying, he told me I can never go to a funeral because it conflicts with Bible class. I've never, ever said that. Never will. I'm not the Lord Jesus Christ. We're dealing with something that's even more important, the Lord incarnate. So I'll never tell you I'm going to all the funerals uh, I, I uh, can go to with my relatives, and I'm not going to uh, forsake that. But I'll probably make it to Bible class, too, because usually funerals don't do, go at night. They go in the morning. And I probably won't go to a viewing, but I might go to the uh, morning thing. And if I'm asked to teach at one, I will and give the gospel because funerals are a wonderful time, uh, because not wonderful for the people involved, but it's a wonderful opportunity to give the gospel. A wonderful opportunity because sometimes uh, people knew the fellow or the gal and uh, they uh, come from work or from wherever they were associated with them. And they walk in, and they walk into the church, and then the pastor can give the gospel. The terrible things about funerals that I've seen, that I went to, where they did, had pastors who didn't know much, is they never gave the gospel. They would talk about the person and how great they were, and they might uh, talk about uh, some comforting verses from Scripture, but I, I've never. There was one time I heard a man give the gospel, and that was encouraging to me, at the funeral and he got it a little messed up but then he went back to scripture and he just started quoting John 3:16 and John 3:17 so he got it right and there were people there who believed and I've uh, preached at two funerals in the past my grandmother's funeral who I called nanny and uh, my aunt's great aunt's funeral and people were saved there and they came up and told me about it. So it's a wonderful opportunity to give the gospel at a funeral. So this isn't, this is, you can take it to, to the extreme and say, I'll never go to a funeral, word of God's too important. No, that would make you weird. But what Jesus is saying, look, this is a different time. I'm on the earth. I'm about to go. Either you follow me now because I'm about to go, or you just uh, go on your own way. He gave him a choice. He said, follow me and let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. And the indication is from the Greek that he went and buried his father and didn't follow the Lord. But he was doing this and being very precise and very tough with these people because he had just developed a large crowd of people. We see that from the previous verses. There were throngs of people all around Jesus. And he says, all right, I'm getting ready to leave. Those of you who are following me, follow me now. And those of you who are staying behind, stay behind. So what he's saying is, look, those of you who have priority number one, the word of God, follow me. Those of you who think something else is more important, go about your own business. He's weeding out the congregation. 
weeding it out. And Jesus Christ didn't care about large crowds, and we see that from 8.20, where he says foxes have dens and all the birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He's homeless. So he's not looking at them, looking to see how much money they have in their wallet that he could extort from them. That's not Jesus. He's on a mission to die as a substitute for everyone. And he, he is being led at this point by the Holy Spirit to leave that large crowd. And he knows that when he leaves, those who, are, who make Bible doctrine number one are the ones who are going to follow him. Those who put it down, number two, number five, number 20, we've all done it on occasion. But I must rebuke it when I see it start to happen. So we've all done it. But what Jesus is saying, number one, and guess who followed him? All his disciples followed him, and a lot of other people followed him across the sea who made it number one. They just left everything behind. They said, this here is the Son of God. There's nothing more important than getting to know the Son of God. Well, he's not going to be here long. It's the only time I'm going to see the Son of God in the flesh until I get to heaven. So I'm following this man. And that, that indicated their priorities were straight. Number one, Bible doctrine. Not number two, not number five. Those, those others, this guy who wanted to bury his father, he was, he was positive to an extent. He wanted to know the Word of God, but he had other issues, you see, that were more important. Whether he got with it later, there's no indication from Scripture. Whether he failed, there's no way we know. But at this point, he fails the test. The test is, Jesus Christ invites him and says, you follow me. And if he would have, it would indicate he had his priorities straight. If he said, no, I got to take care of other business, I'll get back with you, his priorities were all wrong. That's the only point I was making in the past. And Jesus makes the point. Now we go to something new and we'll separate from what I taught last night and we move on to the faith rest testing of the disciples. The faith rest testing of the disciples. And when he boarded the ship, his disciples. Now these are students who have made Bible doctrine number one. They boarded the ship. They're going with the Lord. And this wasn't a little bitty rickety boat. This was a ship that could hold a lot of people. And there were a lot of people on there. And those were the ones who decided at that point, they might have changed their mind later, but at that point they're saying, yes, I want the Word of God. It's number one in my life. Those who were distracted by details did not support Christ in his ministry, and they stayed behind. And their, in their mental attitude, they thought the details of life were more important than the Word of God. So when we boarded the and when he boarded the ship, his disciples followed him. 824. Now they're out there and a great storm. Now this great storm is a squall line. It's a squall line of thunderstorms that often develops around here. Sometimes a squall line can go from all the way up from Ohio all the way down to South Carolina down into Georgia. They can be very long and very powerful and some of the cells in those straw in those in those squall lines some of those thunderstorm cells can produce downburst of 60 mile an hour winds now you force 60 mile an hour winds on a large sea like the Mediterranean Sea and it's gonna push that water up into large waves huge waves and in fact these waves got so large they were crashing over the ship and we see what, uh, so it says, and a great storm developed. Now this is also anal analogous to the spiritual life and analogous to us because all of us are going to have great storms in our life. They, not, they might not be waves slapping over the boat. They might be something else. And we will be tested in that manner. And this was allowed to happen to test the disciples. You see, the disciples had been around the Lord now for a little less than a year. And they had been learning the Word of God for, from Him. And they had been learning the faith rest drill from Him. Furthermore, they knew He was the Son of God. So why would they get frightened? But they do. And that's because they have an old sin nature and they haven't learned enough to apply doctrine. 
And then in 820, and then uh, continuing, it developed on the sea so that the ship was covered in waves. Now the waves overrunning the ship is adversity. And we all know a little bit about adversity, and we've all been through it. But the difference is to know how to handle adversity. You see, you could uh, look at adversity, and the only thing you see is the problem. Or you could look at adversity, and then all you see is the solution, God's solution. Now, if you always focus on the problem and not the solution, you're going to fail, like the disciples are going to fail. And they're going to fail miserably. Why? Because they're looking at the storm. They're looking at the big waves. They're looking at the problem. And they could have looked at the solution. And in fact, since Jesus Christ was right there, they could have said to themselves, Oh, the Son of God is right here. If I'm tossed down into the sea, he will surely snatch me out of it. And he would have. But they had no faith rest. In fact, they're so overrun with fear, they forget that the Son of God is right there with them. I mean, it, 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 it gets blotted out of their stream of consciousness. They don't even think about that. They, they're so focused on the waves and the storm and the lightning. By the way, those storms produce frequent lightning all around that body of water. And lightning is dangerous around water. And it was going off everywhere. Frequent lightning. Sometimes it produces hail. In this case, I don't know if it did. It doesn't say. But with these types of storms, they can produce both small hail, frequent lightning, and winds of up to 60 miles an hour. A, t a tremendous storm and it had probably been coming across the sea so that the waves built up very large but he kept on sleeping who did Christ Christ was asleep waves slapping over the boat lightning everywhere what's Christ doing sleeping genuinely sleeping asleep this shows a relaxed mental attitude plus he was wore out from teaching and teaching and teaching and teaching because uh, he, remember, he had got up earlier that day and was teaching in a city. Then he walked up a mountain, which is, takes a lot of exercise. Our Lord was in shape. He wasn't some skinny, frail man that you usually see in an artist rendition. Our Lord Jesus Christ was strong because he walked everywhere, and he was a tough man. And you wouldn't want to mess with him even just seeing him physically. And he walked up the mountain. Then he taught there with authority. Then he came down the mountain. And he taught down near the sea. Now he's about to go over the sea. He's wore out and he goes to sleep. A storm comes up. This is an indication of a relaxed mental attitude. And he had a re relaxed mental attitude in the middle of a fierce storm. In the middle of a fierce storm of life. And this also occurred because he wanted to teach the disciples a lesson. Look, rest through the storm. Don't freak out. Don't get all worried and think, oh no, everything's going to fall apart. No, rest in the Lord. Rest just like he rested. Then in 825, so they came and got him up, woke him up from a pleasant sleep. He's wore out. And, and when you are scared or when you react to anything in life or when you have fear, worry, or anxiety, when you have any of those things, you become inconsiderate of other people and you want to unload your fear, your worry, and anxiety on others and you want to uh, really make a big deal out of everything. But in this, in this is what they did, the disciples of the Lord. So they got him up from his sleep saying, Lord... And they said, Lord, because they were addressing the deity of God the Son. Save us. We are about to die. The fact that they were concerned with death shows that they were scared of death. And fear was driving their irrationality. Very irrational. So here's the Son of God with them on the boat. And they're scared. Frightened. And you say to yourself, self-righteously, you might say to yourself, you as in everyone who hears this might say to yourself, hey, if I was there with the Lord, no way would I be scared. Man, I know he would be my Lord Jesus Christ, my Savior, and I wouldn't be scared. Well, let me ask you something. Do you get frightened now? 
The things give you fear, worry, and anxiety now. Guess what? Jesus Christ is in you now, in you, in your body. Then he was outside of their body. He was right there and they had access to him and they could talk to him, which might be a source of comfort. But Jesus Christ is in us. So why be scared? Anything that happens to our body, Jesus Christ knows about. He's in us and he knew about it in eternity past anyway. Or anything, if it's our time to go, well, let's go. We're going to heaven anyway. And you might say, well, I'm scared of the pain. I can understand being scared of the pain. Pain is not pleasant. But still, that could be a test in your life that you need to overcome. And once pain in the human body gets so rough, you just pass out anyway. And I think probably the worst pain ever is burning, burning. And that's why we have the lake of fire. It indicates the worst pain that anyone could ever receive, and that's what the unbeliever will receive. So they go and say, Lord, we are about to die. Wake him up out of a nice sleep. And he replied to them. Now, he wasn't very compassionate with them just because they were new believers. And they were relatively new, and they were growing up in grace, and they, but they weren't doing a too good job. They weren't doing too good a job at it right now. And Jesus Christ recognizes this. And he says, why are you cowardly? Now, in the Greek and in the Aramaic, it comes out like this. Why are you worthless and wretched? They woke Jesus Christ out of a sleep, and then he sees them all falling apart and weeping and wailing. I'm going to die, Lord, I'm going to die. And he says, why are you so worthless and wretched? Now, from the human standpoint, they might say, ooh, the Lord's not too good after he's had a nap. He gets a little upset. He's angry with me. How dare he talk to me like that, they might say. But they, they did not criticize the Lord, even though he was being tough with them. But he had to be tough. He had to wake them up. They had been with him now for nearly a year, if not more, and they hadn't learned anything. Oh, sure, they were around him, and they were at every message. They were always there. But just because someone comes to every message doesn't mean they're receptive to it. And they can listen and listen and listen. And if you're not filled with God, the Holy Spirit, it's of no effect. And it was of no effect with them either. And then he goes on to say, you of a little faith. A little faith. Now, they had believed in Christ, of course. So what's he referring to? He's not referring to faith alone and Christ alone so that they can be saved. They're already saved. A little faith He's referring to the faith rest drill. And what he's saying is, you have a little bit of the faith rest drill. You don't have all of it. You still need to grow in your faith. So we choose them on that. Choose them out. Calls them wretched. Calls them worthless. Our Lord Jesus Christ, whom we might see as very nice, sweet, kind, and compassionate. And he was when the time called for it. He was tough also when the time called for it. And his personality was both, well, it was both, uh, well, he was very relaxed. We see that from the fact that he can sleep through a vicious storm. The man was relaxed. He's the son of God. He has to be because it's a sin if you have worry. So he was always relaxed. And then those times when you would look at him, you'd say, that man needs to calm down. He's just ripping everybody apart. It's about time for him to calm down. Just imagine seeing Jesus running through the temple where all the scribes, Pharisees, all the religious people met. And just imagine seeing this man. He walks up normally like everyone else and he sees all of the, these money changers and he sees people making money off the temple and it gives him a bit of uh, righteous indignation. Remember, Christ never sinned. Remember, anger is a sin. And there's a difference between anger and righteous indignation. And he became very righteously indignant. And he just, boom, started throwing things. Rah! And that, that indicates that he had a lot of strength because those tables were heavy. They're not made the way they are today. We make things with light plastic and stuff like that. Those tables were extremely heavy, and he's running around like a maniac, just turning them over. 
and probably shouting doctrine at the same time. Well, you can imagine the religious people seeing all their money getting scattered everywhere, mixing with other people's money. You could imagine the anger that they felt toward the Lord. You could imagine them saying, oh man, this dude is crazy. He calls himself the Son of God. Look at him. He's psychotic. They did that. And they always nitpicked at him because he would tell them the truth and they didn't like it. But it didn't stop him from doing it. And he kept on going. And he was at a point of spiritual self-esteem, of course, where he didn't care. He could have cared less. If there would have been one man on the earth for this whole entire time on the earth who would have believed in Christ, he would have went to the cross for everyone for that one man. If there had been one, only one man, let's say it's in 2020, there would be one man who believes in Christ. He would have died for everyone's sins, including that one man's sin, and he would have saved that one man. Now that's, uh, that's love. Now when he's throwing out the money changers and acting like that, it doesn't seem like love. That's tough love. And then when he dies on the cross, well, that's a tough love too. Very tough. But he is the one who endured the pain. And he did it for us. And he loved us enough to do it. So you see, he could be tough and still love the people. And he did. He loves us. And he's tough with us. And the a gift of pastor teacher demands some type of toughness. And I'm, I, if you don't like it, I'm sorry. But it demands that. And it's just the way it's going to have to be. And I'm not going to change. And then in... Um, 8.27, he says, But the men, you see, before he had been calling them disciples, students. And in the case of before when he called him disciples, he was calling them disciples as in you are the people who have Bible doctrine number one in your life. Then they get on the boat and freak out, so he switches from disciple, which means student, and goes to anthropos, which means man. And you've got to notice that shift. What he's saying is, now you're acting like mere men. Now you're acting like the unbeliever. You're all freaking out, falling apart, having worry, anxiety, and fear. That's what the unbelievers do. So he switches from uh, the word for disciple and moves to anthropos, which means man. You're just a mere man now. You're still saved. You're still a believer. You're still part of the family. But you're acting like a mere man. So, but the men, you see, they boarded the ship as students. Now they are men, acting as mere men, as unbelievers. They were amazed and they said, well, let's, I've skipped a whole half part of 826. Then he said, you have little faith. And then he goes on to say, then he got up and commanded the storm to stop and it became perfectly calm. Then we say, then we see, but the men were amazed. They were amazed at that. Why? He's the Son of God. He can stop the waves. He can clear up the sky just like that. Why would you be amazed with that? Well, they hadn't grown up enough spiritually. They were saved. They knew he was the Son of God, but they had forgot it temporarily. And then when they saw that miracle, they were amazed at the miracle. What they should have been amazed at was all the doctrine he had been teaching them. Because all of that doctrine that he gave them on the mountain, if they had received it, they would have been able to handle that. They would have been able to go through that and use the faith rest drill. But then when uh, they get into the bad situation, they didn't use what they had learned. It, they just forgot all about what they had learned. And they didn't use doctrine because they weren't amazed with doctrine. They were amazed with the miracle. But that shows a failure in their spiritual life because God can perform a miracle in anyone's life in one second. If God wanted to, from his omniscience, to suddenly fill this building up with a million dollar bills, if there is such a thing, he could do it. And it would be a miracle and we would be amazed, me included. But that might, might, that might indicate something of our souls. Maybe we need to look at doctrine as being the money. Doctrine is more important than all that money, than all those million dollar bills that he could produce for us. And just think, any problem in your life, 
if you're looking for a miracle, you say, I have a, such a terrible problem. I wish this and this would happen. And if God granted you every miracle, you would never be able to use doctrine. Because every time a bad situation would come along, you would say, uh, all right, I'm not going to let that happen. Let something else happen. And then God would perform the miracle. And then you would say, I'm fine now. But if we could just perform miracles all the time or get God to perform them for us, we would never grow up spiritually. These hardships in life, even though they are difficult when we receive them, it's a time for us to use the faith rest drill. And oftentimes we'll fail. And what this is saying is, yeah, sometimes you'll fail in the use of the faith rest drill because we all have sin natures. And sometimes we'll get bent out of shape when we shouldn't have been bent out of shape. And what this is saying is the Lord will still deliver you. The Lord knows the thoughts and intents of your heart. I don't. I just know that I have to motivate, encourage, that I have to reprove, correct, and instruct. That's part of my job. And I don't know where you are in your spiritual life. I don't care to know. But God does. And he knows if you're interested in growing up in the Word of God. And when a test comes along, he'll provide for you. Even if you fail, because we all are going to fail, even if even those who are positive are always going to fail a test. We're going to get to it, and suddenly we're going to lose our composure, and we're going to uh, stop thinking in terms of doctrine and start thinking in terms of how do I solve this myself and keep looking at the problem. And then, well, God will deliver us anyway, even though we are being nitwits. And that's what the Lord would call us, just like he did the disciples. But right now he's calling them worthless and wretched. Later he'll call them dumbheads and nitwits and all kinds of things. Not to insult them in sin, but to get them to wake up to the importance of the Word of God. And it worked. It took time. I mean, he continuously did it, and we'll get through all of these verses. He continuously uh, would throw out an insult. We would consider it an insult and continuously rebuke them, continuously tell them where they're wrong and where they need to straighten out, continuously. Now, if they had reacted, as some of them did, and said, you know what, you can't talk to me that way. Nobody ever, ever talks to me that way, and I'm definitely not letting this man talk to me that way, and I'm leaving this. He must think he's something special talking. Well, he was. He was the Son of God, had every right to talk that way. Some left, but the disciples stayed, even though they got their toes stepped on all the time. All the time. But they grew up. And Peter grew up so much that he was finally martyred on a cross, hung upside down on a cross. Now he's in heaven today, and he has a lot of rewards awaiting him. Now in 827, where it says the men, of course, and they said then, what kind of person is this? that even the winds and the sea obey him. Well, they're acting like if, as if they never knew it. Can't you understand the frustration of our Lord? They had already believed in Christ. They believed that he was the Son of God. And th then a big storm comes up and they forget all about it. They're, they're, they're not even thinking about the Lord or anything else. And then when he does a miracle, they say, What kind of man is this? While he was teaching doctrine, they didn't say, hmm, what kind of man is this who can teach such things? But when he performed a miracle, they said, what kind of man is this? And can you imagine our Lord hearing that after he had been with them for so long? He said, you, you would th if he had a sin nature, we would bop him on the head and say, I'm the son of God, don't you remember? But he... He didn't bop them on the head, but he did insult them to try to get them back in line. He also showed them grace. He oscillated back and forth whenever he felt it was necessary. So we too better recognize the power of God because God is very powerful and we serve a very powerful God. And we must recognize that. And we must recognize that any problem in our life, any storm, any wave of adversity, anything that tries to knock us off balance, He's there with us. You see, he was there with them. He's with us too. In fact, he's in us. And if you have the word of God and if you've been learning the word of God, there is nothing that can shake you. 
Nothing that can uh, distract you. Nothing that can take you off balance. You just uh, deploy the flight line. Remember the flight line. Deploy those 10 problem-solving devices. And you might get scared at first. Something happens and you might fall all apart and be a little bit shaken. Well, then you got rebound. Then you got the filling of God, the Holy Spirit. Then you've got the faith rest drill, grace and doctrinal orientation, a personal sense of destiny, personal love for God the Father, impersonal love for all mankind. Those two are the integrity envelope, personal love for God the Father and impersonal love for all mankind. And that works very well in marriage. And, and marriage is always a sensitive place and it's always a place where people need, everyone needs, both personal love for God the Father and impersonal love for mankind. Marriage is also a place where you need to give people freedom. And, and now, if, if my wife were to tell me, I don't like the way you teach, I quit. I, I would be devastated, of course. And I, would, uh, and I would probably go out of fellowship several times and tell her uh, where to go and uh, how wrong she is. But that would be my wrong, not hers. She has freedom. And you can't force anyone to do anything when it comes to the spiritual life. Now you are, as the man, the authority and the leader. But when you lead, it's always by example. And when you are angry all the time, I'm not saying this about anyone here, just anyone in general, it happens in marriage all the time. All, all the time. I mean, we've all had conflicts in marriage. There's an, the, if you meet somebody who says, I have a perfect marriage, they're lying to you. Everyone has conflict in marriage. You're two sin natures sitting there. And you're always going to have an argument here and there. Sometimes more than others, and sometimes it'll smooth out. And then you'll have some more. But the thing is, uh, when you get with the Word of God, you lead by example in the spiritual life. And just as the woman, if the woman's the one going to spiritual maturity, she can't nag that husband to come with her. And you, you might want to th put yourself in their shoes, or she might want to put herself in your shoes. And I've known lots of women who were great spiritually who married an idiot. Now, it is harder for the woman who marries an idiot than for the man. Because the man is the aggressor. The man can do what he wants, see? If the wife tells the man, don't go back to that church anymore, the man's the authority and he could say, look, you do what you want, I'm going here. And that would be perfectly all right. But the woman under the authority of the man, if the man says, look, I do not permit you to go to a, a Baptist church, I do not permit you to go to a Pentecostal church, I do not permit you to go to a Methodist church, you must go where I go. They are, they are obligated to your authority. And even though they may go with you, they're going to resent you for it. And they will probably resent the message as well. So you can't do that. you got to give them space. I have to give my wife space. It's something I had to learn myself because I was always gung-ho for doctrine as a teenager, not bragging. It's just the way it was. When I met my wife, she, she was positive toward the word, but, uh, you know, we always kind of want to mold them into our own uh, perfect image. Like, uh, man, she's not exactly the way I want her. Let me mold a little bit. We can't do it. It causes resentment. It causes strife. And when you have strife in marriage, you're not filled with the Spirit. And when you're not filled with the Spirit, you're not fulfilling the spiritual life. So sometimes we have to say to ourselves... I'll do it myself and I give freedom to the other partner. It goes for man and woman uh, uh, giving freedom. Now I know marriage is an intimate situation but you have to give people freedom. It's impossible, it, absolutely impossible. Uh, they'll, hate, they'll hate you for dragging them in and they'll feel uncomfortable being there. They don't want to be there. You'll feel uncomfortable because you want to see if they're getting the point or not. And it, it, it causes strife. They'll come along if they, if, if they realize they need it later or they'll go someone, somewhere else. And that's where you use impersonal love. It's something that you have as a believer. 
There's no reason to freak out, really. I, I know it's intimate, I know it's tempting, but there's no reason to just fly off the handle. No, and I'm not preaching to anyone specifically here. I mean, everybody has problems in marriage. Everyone. It's going to happen. It's impossible for it not to happen. That's why God gives us these solutions. Personal love for God. What do you say to yourself when uh, your wife isn't uh, being the way you want her to or if your husband isn't following in the footsteps that you wanted to? You switch to personal love for God. And you say, you know what, I love God. And then impersonal love for mankind. And while you personally love for your wife, sometimes if you're about to get angry, it's like flicking a switch. And you have to go from personal love for your wife, which you should have, because it's a personal relationship, and then switch it. When, when she starts to get on your nerves, instead of reacting, flick the switch to impersonal love. That's how you solve the problem. And then when that person sees you can handle so many things, when that person begins to see you acting differently, when that person begins to see you living happily, whether they are or not, you see, that would be the most irritating thing for a lot of people, is to see their spouse very happy and they're sitting back in misery. And it happens a lot. And one day they'll wake up and say, I'm so miserable, and look up at the spouse and say, he's so happy or she's so happy, I must be doing something wrong. And they'll get with it. Without saying a word, remember from 1 Peter chapter 3, without saying a word, without nagging. Nobody likes nagging. Nobody likes criticism. And I understand that. When I get up here, it sounds like I'm criticizing you. Nobody likes it. Well, it's instruction and it's not, uh, it's, it's not meant to be harmful or hateful at all. That's, uh, and I'm not trying to throw my authority around like a dictator. That's ridiculous. And it's just, it, it has nothing to do with that. Sometimes there's misunderstanding in communication. That happens a lot in all relationships in life. And it's, it's unfortunate that it happens. But we can clear it up and move on. So 828... When he came to the other side, to the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were extremely violent, so that no one was able to pass by that way. You see, there was a lot of demon possession going on at that time. First of all, because our Lord was there and they knew he was. And secondly, because in Israel... Well, it was a time of great apostasy. And anywhere where there is great apostasy, there will be demon activity, such as in Africa today. There are portions of Africa where there's not one believer. And they all congregate and they have a spirit worship and Satan worship and all of that. And they do become demon-possessed. And along with demon possession becomes unnatural strength. I read a story one time of a woman who got to, who possibly, it doesn't say, the, the man conjectured maybe she was demon-possessed. He wasn't even a believer, but he saw it and he freaked out because his wife suddenly one night went nuts, went violently nuts. And you know how many, it took five men to restrain her. And that she was throwing them off like dolls. A woman, a petite woman throwing off strong men, great large hunters they were, with muscles, just throwing them off. And so when she woke up, she looks out, and they're all looking at her terrified, all scratched up, and she says, what's wrong with you? She didn't even remember the whole thing. So they came to the conclusion, yeah, that was demon possession. And the man wrote in the book as an unbeliever, I never believed in that before, but then when I saw it, I definitely believe in demon possession now. Now, if you believe in demon possession, it doesn't save you. And he wasn't saved, but after that had happened to him, he said, yep, something was going on there. So they have abnormal strength. And this, there's a funny story related to this in the Acts. I'll tell you about it. I won't turn you there, and then I'll let you go. In the Acts, there was a, a demon-possessed man, and all of the apostles had the ability to exercise the demon at that time. But the, this man didn't have that gift. He wasn't an apostle. May have not even been a believer. 
And if he was, he was a stupid believer. And he walks up uh, to this demon and he's going to cast out the demon. And the demon beats the living crap out of him. Well, he didn't know. He didn't know what he was doing. Didn't have the gift. It'd be like a Catholic priest going up and trying to exorcise someone like on the exorcist. Then the demon jumped into him and he jumped out the window. That's the best part of that movie when that Catholic priest jumped out of that window and splat. And that, it was funny because that's the way it, the movie didn't intend it that way. They didn't have any doctrine. But the, here's the priest suddenly being possessed by a demon. Yeah, well, most priests are unbelievers, not all. And then he goes nuts and jumps out a window and kills himself. You have to laugh at that part if you really think about it for a minute. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for this wonderful privilege to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and so that we might take these things and come to understand who and what Christ was on the earth, who and what he is today, and how we might uh, live the same unique spiritual life that he lived so that we can glorify you. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.